Hey there, when I, this is another video. <laughs> when I did a teaching the other day about uh, how to know if you're listening to a grace teacher, part two, um, you know, the it, it was an hour and a half long, but the last half hour was important. I'm not sure everybody heard it, but uh, one of the things is, you know, you could talk about grace, uh, but if I, what I did was I went through the history of the Bible and showed where grace comes from and what it is based on these covenant promises God made to Christ. You know, grace is God fulfilling certain things that he has accomp uh, now accomplished. He said he would do certain things, right, in, in Christ, and that's called the gospel, that he preached even to Abraham in Genesis 12. He said, blessing, I will bless you, Genesis uh, Galatians 3 says that he, the scripture preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham in Genesis 12. God preached the gospel to Adam and Eve when he promised the seed of the woman in Genesis 3. Uh, the, the book of Matthew and the book of Luke begin with genealogies, which are stories of God's faithfulness to preserve the seed and preserve the title and preserve the birthright to the throne of David in order to honor the covenants that he is uh, that he sent Jesus Christ to confirm uh, you know uh, according to Romans 15 8 Jesus Christ was a minister to the circumcision to confirm the promises made to the fathers concerning the kingdom when he said repent the kingdom of God is at hand he was speaking about little prom literal promises that God had made. If it was not to be taken literally, why bother with the genealogies and all those stories? You know, why have Luke's genealogy that traces Mary's blood, you know, the blood he received from Mary through the house of David back to Adam to show that he has the genetic line? All the way, you know, the pure genealogy to Adam, uh, so that he could be the last Adam, uh, and then show that from Joseph he actually inherited the title uh, to the throne of David from the house of David, you know, uh, from through Solomon's line, even though that line eventually was cursed. Through Jeconiah. I mean, if you know the story, that's why there that is praise God Mary was from the house of David, because if she wasn't, uh, then he wouldn't have been able to be of the throne of David. He inherited the title to the throne of David through Joseph by adoption and the blood to the throne of David through Mary. They both had to be of the house of David. The, the point I'm making is that all the, the genealogies represent all the intrigues and the devil's attacks on the line and God's faithfulness preserved the line to literally fulfill the promise. And so the first hour is me speaking about grace comes from the literal fulfillment of God's promises and his faithfulness to his word. And then that last half hour I spoke about the fact that if you're listening to a teacher who doesn't take the Bible literally... Uh, and just says this is allegorical and that allegorical, even if they're contending for the gospel, eventually the foundation you're standing on isn't going to be very sure at all. Um, and yes, it's upsetting. It should be upsetting. It's, it, it is damnable heresy and antichrist doctrine to teach that the promises that God made to Israel and the clear teaching of the word that he will bring them back into their land and fulfill the promises to them and graft them back in fall on the church and that it's all allegorical and that what God literally means uh, when he says things is actually something different than what he literally said now of course there are poetic meanings but the Bible tells us when God is using uh, poetic meanings. When he's, you know, uh, I think it was either Petra or Nick C that did a good job of talking about, you know, 
we take it literally unless it tells us not to. Now, the book of Revelation, yes, it is signified. It's written in signs. But those signs are a roadmap to the Bible, not a roadmap to your freedom to interpret however you want and say, well, it's allegorical. John was in the spirit, which is basically like saying he was drunk. And so you can't take any of it literally. All that means is you don't believe the Bible. Uh, you haven't done your homework to go look up the significance of those signs. Every single one of those signs is an allusion to an Old Testament idiom. The whole thing is written in code. Uh, Chuck Missler always said that, that it's, what is it? 400 verses with 800 allusions, or is it 800 verses? No, it's 400 versions, verses with 800 allusions to Old Testament um, prophecies. Every sign, every picture is an allusion to a major theme in Scripture. You know, when you see Jezebel, it's expected that you're going to go back to Kings and read about her character and what she did. When you see Balaam, uh, Balaam teaching Balak to cause uh, Israel to stumble, and he says, you've got this doctrine among you, it's expected that you're going to go back to Numbers and find out what that is. When you see the woman uh, clothed with the sun, standing on the moon and the 12 stars, you're supposed to recognize that from Joseph's dream in Genesis and go read Israel's interpretation of the dream, Jacob's interpretation. The Bible interprets the Bible. It is not subject to private interpretation. Peter said no scriptures of private interpretation. Holy men of old were moved uh, by the Holy Spirit. And you have a more sure word of prophecy, which you do well to heed. It's more sure than this eyewitness account of Peter and the apostles. They were on the mount when they see Christ uh, transfigured, right? When they saw Christ transfigured, he said, we were, we were not following cunningly devised fables. We were eyewitnesses. But you have a more sure word of prophecy, which you do well to heed. As a light that shines in the darkness until the day breaks, and the morning star rises in your heart. We have a certain word, a more sure word. God puts his word above his name. You know, you, it, you can argue for the gospel all you want and talk about justification by faith and untwist scriptures all you want. But if you spit the word out uh, that those scriptures come from, then you are tearing at the foundation if the foundation is destroyed, what can the righteous to do? Now, this last week, I learned that, you know, a gr prominent grace, someone who's they've been contending for the gospel, but also telling us that we need to not be dogmatic uh, and how much harm that's doing to evangelism and how much harm that's doing to the so-called growth in the body of Christ. Uh, and and they, they make a principle. They, they, they use that Augustine quote uh, that I mentioned in my community post about uh, in um, essentials, unity, non-essentials, love, all, uh, or tolerance, I'm sorry, and all things love. Sounds beautiful. Unless it's a control mechanism to just stifle dissent. Uh, well, they did a, uh, and, and they've done this before. They did a, uh, whole, you know, video, I guess, teaching or interview where they just castigated dispensationalism and held up Darby and, and it's a straw man argument to hold up Darby and try to poke holes in him when you haven't read Darby. When you just heard, when you say, oh, I was a dispensationalist, and what you mean is I used to believe that prophecy is literal and future. Uh, and when you talk about Darby, that's what you mean. That just shows you have not read Darby, and you've not read the Brethren. You don't know who the Brethren were. And I talk about that quite a bit on this channel, but dispensationalism is not prophecy charts and rapture geeks 
If that is a mischaracterization, it's a cartoon caricature that is fairly recent because what we have today is pop culture prophecy studies. And, you know, uh, most of the prophecy channels today, the only reason they know what the rapture is is because of the work that the brethren did. True. But they haven't read the brethren. And they're the ones that are talking about the rapture today are sensationalistic news pimps um, that are lordshippers and Calvinists. Well, dispensationalism, the, the point of dispensationalism was not to uh, preach about the rapture and preach about prophecy. That's not the point. The point of dispensationalism was to recognize that Paul had been given a dispensation of the grace of God for the Gentiles to reveal a mystery. I keep talking about this. Concerning Christ in you, the hope of glory, and that is the rule of the Christian life, and it's found in the epistles. And that Calvinism, uh, see, see, the brethren were raised up by God to contend with Calvinism of the day, which was the lordship of the day. It's the most pernicious, evil cult in the history of Christianity besides Catholicism be, because it, it, it's actually it's worse than Catholicism because it pretends to be Protestant and is so masterful at cloaking itself in the language of grace that most people believe that Calvinists believe justification by grace through faith. Uh, when actually they've redefined what justification is, they've redefined what faith is, and it's a backloaded works gospel through and through. It's law through and through. Um, the, the brethren were raised up to contend with Calvinism because what they saw was that Calvinism, by confusing the church with Israel, put the church under Israel's law and thought that the synoptic gospels uh, was also the rule of life for the Christian and, and used the Sermon on the Mount to terrify people, which is just the law of Moses. The Sermon on the Mount is the law of Moses. <laughs> Uh, it's based on the ninth commandment, thou shalt not covet. And so it deals with the heart. Even if you have lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. If you hate in your heart, you've committed murder. It's not what you do outwardly. It's what you think before you've even had a chance to repent of it. <laughs> it's what automatically comes out of the heart. It's your, your flesh is ruined. God had to crucify you. And that is the revelation we receive from Paul, the dispensation of the grace of God is that we were baptized into the death of Christ and made one with him and raised together with him to be part of a new species called the body of Christ. Heavenly. We are heavenly. And there's a dispensation of truth for us. That's what dispensationalism is. Dispensationalism is not prophecy charts and rapture teachings and uh, speculation about when the Antichrist is coming. However, as a side product, because the brethren were faithful, what they, what they saw was that the scriptures are literal, not allegorical. Because the Reformation had gone as far as recovering justification by faith, but had not recovered the literal uh, promises of God. And so is they were still, like Luther was virulently anti-Semitic. He still believed, you know, the state church should, he believed in a state church, for one, and he still persecuted the Jewish people. The Protestants were persecuting people because they didn't see the distinction between spiritual and carnal because in their mind, they were the Israel of God, the covenant people. They still have an earthly view of the kingdom because they believe that the church is the kingdom. They're dominionist. So the kingdom's in our heart. Therefore, we are the representation of the kingdom. Therefore, our godliness should be expressed as we take over the earth. That's what dominionism is. It's the logical extension of the kingdom is in our heart. 
And if it's ever going to get established around here, then we need to make just laws that are godly. And that's where you get Salem witch trials and people being burned at the stake for heresy. Uh, you get a marriage of the church and the state. And Luther started the church state in Germany. Uh, the ch state church, sorry. The German, you know, uh, state church. But uh, this was all because of allegorization. And the brethren, were English brethren, were descendants of the Moravian brethren who had gotten together at Count Zindendorf's island because they'd fled from all the persecution of the Roman Catholics and the Protestants. Uh, the, the, it was a mess out there. And they got together, and that was the beginning of the Great Awakening. 90% of them sold themselves into slavery. Uh, I'm sorry, no, 90% of them became missionaries, and many of them sold themselves into slavery to preach the gospel. That was the first time anything like that had happened since like the days of St. Patrick and the early church, you know, third and first, third and fourth and fifth century. Uh, and they call that the Great Awakening because it was the beginning of modern evangelism, this idea that the gospel's better than anything. You know, I'm willing to, I'm, I, I'm giving up this world for my heavenly calling. Uh, and that was the beginning of the Church of Philadelphia. Most people have that view, you know, that um, Christ opened a door for the gospel. And there was so much light pouring out of the word for these people. And they met together, according to 1 Corinthians 14, when you come together, each one has. One has a psalm, one has a... They, they rejected the clergy laity system, the Nicolaitans, uh, where one man speaks and you have a professional clergy. They believed every member of the body should function. And because of that, they had a powerful move of God. And eventually that expressed itself in some of the best, most powerful teaching on grace in the history of the church, which is the Plymouth Brethren. Um, and you're dealing with Darby and C.H. McIntosh and uh, people from that time, uh, from that group. And, and a lot of people have said you have not improved on their teaching on grace because it is a recovery of Paul's ministry in full with an emphasis on the fact that the promises to Israel are yet to be fulfilled. They don't fall on the church. Our rule of life is not Moses. See, the justification by faith under Luther was a mix because even though they knew that justification was by faith, because they thought the church was Israel, they went back to the law for a rule of life, thinking that Moses is how we live. They really couldn't separate the church out from under the law. And so they lived under a mixture of law and grace, to where Schofield, a dispensationalist, said, you know, in the 1850s, that the church was under a, was thoroughly, the Protestant church was thoroughly glacialized, Galatianized, they lived under a mixture, incoherent mix of law and grace. The law was not given its proper function as a ministry of condemnation and death, but we were taught that we must keep it, and by the Holy Spirit's help, we, we, we may. That is not the ministry of the Holy Spirit to help you keep the law. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is to minister Christ to you as life. If there was a law that could have given life, then righteousness would have come by the law. But God's intention is for you to have life, and for that he gave you Christ as the Spirit. And we were baptized into Christ, we were crucified together with him, we died to the law, and now it is no longer I but Christ. And that is the Christian life. That's what the brethren taught. Everything, you know. So, so here's the thing. You can pretend to teach grace and even go to Romans and teach about justification. But if you say we're Israel and all those promises are allegorical and you castigate the brethren and hold up Darby as a straw man, make a cartoon out of him and, and disparage him and say, oh, I was a dispensationalist, but you say it's just about prophecy. And you say, now I've embraced partial preterism, even though you know that that was invented by the Catholics in order to stifle dissent and keep themselves in power, what are you doing? You know, number one, 
That wasn't Tari's point. Yes, the, the brethren did take the scriptures literally and they started to catalog. These promises belong to Israel. These promises belong to the church. The church is not Israel. And then they began to see, oh, the judgment seat for the church is different than the judgment seat for the nations. In the Great White Throne, there's three judgment seats. So they wrote about the judgment in, uh, for the church, which is a celebratory victory uh, day, like the Greek celebrations of the Olympics called the Bema seat in the heavens. That's a, it's not on the earth. It's not when Christ sets up the Davidic throne, nor is it the great white throne judgment where he judges the unbelievers according to their works and throws them into the great uh, lake of fire. It is for the believers, the bride of Christ, who have built with gold, silver, and precious stones and been built to become the masterpiece of God and are being put on display as God's trophy in the heavens before the angels. It's a day of celebration without sin. No reference to sin. He comes with it and his reward is with him. And the rapture is a day to look forward to. And it was hidden. It was a mystery. It's part of the mystery that Paul was commissioned to reveal. So when they talked about the rapture, that's how they talked about it. They were not sitting there. I mean, there was a little speculation about, well, when would it be? It'll, probably, it'll be before the 70th week of Daniel. Okay, but they didn't try to. They didn't do what people are doing today, where they're looking at their calendars and having dreams and trying to guess the day of the rapture. That's a bunch of garbage. Those people are all works anyway. No, this was some of the greatest. This was some of the. This was the greatest outpouring of teaching about grace in the history of the church because it was so clear, but it was rejected by almost everybody because. They reject Paul's ministry. And that's really what the root of it is, is they reject the distinction between the ministry of earthly Jesus and the synoptic gospels and the heavenly ascended Christ in the body of truth that he reveals called the dispensation of the grace of God for the Gentiles. That's where we get the term dispensationalism. Pauline dispensationalism is not prophecy charts and rapture bingo. Oh, that makes me mad. The ignorance. Um, because there's so many people calling themselves dispensationalists, that they're the ones who created the caricature, that now people are mocking and saying, well, I don't want anything to do with that. And instead of going back to the word, they're throwing the word out altogether. I kind of get that from a emotional, humanistic point of view. But it's still rebellion, and it's still heresy. Um, so the people that are teaching us and, and, and castigating us and, and you know telling us we all need to be walking in love and that the wolves are our mission field. You know, we need to be walking in love towards them. There. And, and in some cases can't even discern the difference between a wolf and a sheep. Because they've got a mix of law and grace in their teaching. When it comes to sanctification and rewards, it's, all, it's law. Why? Because they don't make these distinctions. Why? Because they're not dispensational. Does that mean that they're not prophecy geeks? No. They think they've thrown out Bible prophecy, but what they threw out was Paul's ministry and the distinctions. Uh... So they're not grace, okay? That they can contend for eternal security, but that's as far as it goes. And then they say, we're being dogmatic by making all these distinctions. And yet they are super dogmatic. When it, they, they, they say, we tolerate everything but those dispensationalists, basically. You know, and they just mock and throw out dispensationalism, not even knowing what it is. And they're not going to the scriptures to tell you what dispensationalism is. They're going to other people's teachings. So what they do is they say, I used to be a dispensationalist. And it's not because I read Darby. It's because I read people that said they were dispensationalist, and I thought I agreed with them. But now I've read people that 
debunked dispensationalism, and now I agree with them. You're just following men. Uh, so that's not the same thing as I'm a Berean and I've searched the scriptures. No, you're not searching the scriptures if you're allegorizing everything you don't agree with. Oh, that's allegorical. Well, that's not what that literally means. That's not what that literally means. Book of Revelation is just, you know, he's in the spirit. You have to remember he's in the spirit. So you can't take it literally. He's in the spirit. Oh, you mean he's drunk? He's stoned? I saw a documentary on uh, Time or whatever a few years back where they, it was about the book of Revelation. And I, I couldn't believe Christians were watching this thing. And the whole premise was, well, he was stoned. He was, he was drunk. He said he was in the spirit. And, and, and for them, that meant like he was a shaman going into an altered state of consciousness where he's incoherent and everything he came out with was from this root state of animal primitism, uh, you know, and it's basically Freudian imagery from the subconscious and from his ego and his id and that struggle. I mean, you know, that's what people believe. It might as well be just demons. And so they basically tell you to stay away from it. But they're allowed to interpret it freely. That's what makes me mad, is they present themselves as the authority and interpret it freely and stumble babes in Christ. While teaching the doctrine of Balaam, which they say is allegorical, you know, you should get along with the wolves. They're the mission field. You need to walk in love and stop being dogmatic. This community is in division, and these people are troublemakers and divisive. No, this community is not in division. You need to know the difference between a wolf and a sheep. Uh, so I'm done. You know, I really, <laughs> I've tried for a long time to give the benefit of the doubt and say, you know, because of their contending for eternal security, uh, that I honor, and I do. But eternal security is not the is not the whole gospel. We used to say Osas is the gospel. But as we've learned, the Calvinists say that. Just believing that eternal life is forever and you can't lose it is not the gospel if you can tell someone that, well, maybe they don't have it because they believed with their mind but not with their heart. No, it is to him who works not but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. And how do I know that that's true? What assurance do I have that Paul's gospel is true? You know? what? How do I know how to measure that testimony by anything and say, I know this is true? And see, this is where the people that have been taught uh, in this kind of evangelical circle, the way they've been taught to believe is to say, I know I believe. Do you believe you believe? Yes, I believe. Do you believe you believe you believe? Yes, I believe. I know I believe. And that's what they think we're doing when we talk about preaching the gospel to yourself. No, we're not trying to convince ourselves that we've believed. We are enjoying our inheritance and building ourselves up in our most holy faith based on what we've already believed. They're trying to convince themselves that they've believed in an absence of actually believing the word. So it's not based on believing the word is literal. It's based on convincing themselves that they believe, marching around going, I know I believed. I know, did you believe you believe? Yeah, I knew I believe. You know, that's actually what they do to, in their evangelical altar call and training of eternal security. How do you know that you believe the gospel? Well, I know I believed it. Do you really believe? Yeah, I believed it. And they repeat that. Don't let the devil tell you didn't believe. No, I believed. Okay, it's not based on your, your ability to convince yourself you believed. We need to behold the power of the word and be transformed and, and just be in awe at the precision of the word. And yes, it's by the Holy Spirit, but, you know, the great, the, the, when I got saved, I, I'm very thankful. The two, I was taught, uh, I had that book by Wolverton Schaefer, Major Bible Themes, and I also heard Chuck Missler. And Chuck Missler, now, he didn't get too much into the doctrine of Christ, unfortunately. 
But one gift he had was to show you the integrity of the scriptures. That God supernaturally designed, he, you know, he was famous for saying, here we have a message system that was designed from outside the time domain, 66 books over written over thousands of years by more than 40 authors in three different languages. And yet, as we examine it, the more we get into it, the more we see that every detail is supernaturally placed and supernaturally designed from outside the time domain. And Jesus Christ is on every page. And he could show you, and it was, he could show you all the types. A lot of the, actually he was very Christ focused when it came to this aspect of his ministry. He could go through Genesis, he could go through Ruth, he could go through the books of the Bible and show you Christ on every page. He could go through the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Rachel, and sh and the nameless servant, and show you, here's the Father, here's the Son, here's a type of Christ in his death and resurrection, here's a type of Christ sending the servant, Eliezer, whose name means comforter, to go get a bride for Isaac while he waited at his father's house uh, after his death and resurrection, after the offering. I mean, he was so good at that, that you just would praise God at how the word from the beginning to the end shows the whole story in every type, every figure, every detail. And you can take God at his word. He puts his word above his name. Uh, you can believe it. And because of the integrity of that message system, uh, when we see what Paul says in Romans, it's consistent with the whole narrative of Scripture. And again, I know that Jesus, you know, when Jesus rose from the dead, what did he do? He didn't just show up and say, see, now you see me. You know I'm raised from the dead. Do you believe you believe? Do you really believe? No. He opened their understanding and gave them a Bible study showing them all the places from Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning himself that he must suffer these things, die and be resurrected. He showed that he literally fulfilled the scriptures. Uh, uh, it's just allegorical. You know, that he anchors their belief of the disciples not in a physical event but in the word the more sure word of prophecy which peter says we were didn't follow cunningly devised fables and myths we saw him transfigured but you have a more sure word of prophecy we don't follow men we follow the word of god that's our authority and when you allegorize the word and scoff at it like that and then make up whatever interpretation you want. Oh, I think the mark of the beast has been here all along, and the hand means this, and the forehead means that, and this is that. And this. It's all private interpretations. No, the, the, there's somebody called the idle shepherd in Zechariah 11.7. And there is a real false prophet who is really going to make an image. He's going to have the whole world make an image to the beast that can move and speak. And they're going to have to worship it. He's going to call fire down from heaven in the sight of everybody. Uh, they're not going to be able to buy or sell without the image of the beast. It's going to be in the temple. It's going to be called the abomination of desolation. It's going to be in Jerusalem. Okay, It's going to be televised or something where everybody can see it. That's in the scripture and it's literal. Yes, there were types and foreshadows, Antiochus Epiphanes and Titus Aspasian, but it has yet to literally be fulfilled. It's still future. John wrote Revelation uh, not about 70 AD, okay? If you think, you know, oh my gosh. And you say, well, it's secondary. We can agree to disagree. And up until a little while ago, I would have agreed with that because I, I agree. It's that you can be saved and agree to disagree. But if you're just using that to give yourself the license to be dogmatic and overthrow people's faith in the word and teach uh, and, and, and to misrepresent Darby, who you've not even read, uh, 
and take away. You know, what, the, the thing I like about Chuck Missler, what I'm saying is everything he was quoting was brethren truth. I didn't know that at the time. I thought, oh, wow, Chuck Missler, man, he's really... Such... No, the, it was the brethren that opened all those types because they understood two principles. The law of first mention and expositional constancy that when God first brings up a term, it's typically the way he defines it throughout the scripture. And you will find that throughout the entire message system, he uses it the same way. And that it was based on that principle that we got the Strong's Concordance. Why have a dictionary that shows you everywhere in the Bible that a Greek word appears or a Hebrew word appears? Because of the law of expositional constancy to keep you from privately interpreting things the way you want to interpret them. Because God uses symbols consistently all the way through. Gold is always something specific. Silver is always some pointing to something specific. You know, the lampstands are always pointing to something specific. And Revelation is full of specific signs that point to things that are consistently interpreted through the scripture, not left to your imagination. Um... So, yes, it's secondary. You can say Israel is the church until you start teaching that sanctification is by law and that Moses or the Synoptic Gospels is the rule of life. If you use your secondary uh, allegorization, you know, your secondary view, which means we're, we can have a different view about it and agree to disagree, to deny the doctrine we've received from heaven... And the dispensational distinction, the dispensation of the grace of God that was given to Paul, and twist what he's saying to say that we've been grafted into Israel, and that the church is Israel, and that there is no literal kingdom. And you you do wordplay, and you say, well, I believe that there's a kingdom, but really it's all at the end. You know, uh, there is no kingdom. There's no literal millennium. There's no literal... Uh, it's just we're going to go to heaven, okay? That is wordplay. You're pretending to give uh, lip service to something you don't believe, but really you believe something else. That's private. You're you're even almost bringing private privately bringing in something unaware, bringing in teaching that you don't want to admit that you believe. Uh, no, it's not secondary at that point. It was, it's secondary if we really can agree to disagree and still stay in fellowship. But if you say we're not allowed to be dogmatic, we're nitpicky and we're not walking in love because we're making the distinction. And then you do teaching where you mock what we teach, right? And, and throw it out and even misrepresent it and misrepresent Darby and uh, really slander him usually is what they do. They end up slandering Darby. Call him a Calvinist and stuff like that. I've heard some of these things before. And it's like, man, you have not read Darby. Because he talked about predestination, they assume he's a Calvinist. Well, Paul talked about predestination. Read Ephesians. And, and see, this all comes down to reading not the Bible, but what men say about the Bible. Well, this theologian said that, and this theologian said that. You know, that's why we have to be in the Word. Uh, because what they do is they say, Darby was a Calvinist because he talked about predestination. But he was raised up to fight Calvinism. <laughs> and that just shows that you don't know what Calvinism is. Because <laughs> Calvinism is not, the predestination is not in the tulip. It's not one of the, it's not the P in the tulip. And that's another thing. It's a mis it's a it's a straw man about what Calvinism is. Everybody thinks Calvinism is a is an argument between free will and fate or predestination and free will. No, it's not. That's a straw man. Calvinism is about how is someone saved and how can they know they're saved? Is the gospel the evidence that I'm saved or do I have to be one of the elect? How do I know I'm one of the elect? Well, they say it's by fruit bearing by the new heart that God created in you before you could even be regenerated. And he had to choose you to do that. And you'll never know if that was you just by believing the gospel. You have to bear the fruit. That's the, that's the sum of it. And God only saved a certain number of people called the elect. We're also totally depraved 
that none of us could even believe. So he had to give us a new heart for the new covenant in order to enable us to believe. So he had to regenerate us before we believed. Okay, that's total depravity, the T. Um, Greg goes into that stuff a lot better. Limited atonement, Christ only died for the elect. That's a lie. Uh, irresistible grace, you cannot harden yourself against the grace of God. If you do, it's because God hardened you. And if you sin, it's because God made you do it. That's sick. And then the perseverance of the saints, you can't know by believing the gospel if you're saved. You have to bear the fruit. Uh, you may have head faith, but not heart faith. That's Calvinism. Calvinism is not about predestination. And so a lot of times when I teach through Ephesians and I talk about predestination from Paul's point of view, which is about the inheritance that God has set aside for his children, people accuse me of being a Calvinist. Why? Because they've read theologians arguing about other theologians and they haven't read the Bible. Well, you're definitely not going to read the Bible if you think it's a bunch of allegory and you hold it on the same level as human tradition. And that's what people who allegorize the Bible do. They hold it at the level of human tradition. And they talk more about human tradition than they do about the Bible. And they have long podcasts or whatever about this church theologian and that I used to be I used to agree with this guy but now I agree with that guy and they adopt terms I used to be a dispensationalist now I'm a partial preterist well those terms are not in the Bible <laughs> and when I say dispensationalism I'm not talking about the prophecy ge geeks in the rapture charts although that does come out of it because they did eventually say okay these scriptures belong to Israel and are promises for their kingdom and these belong to the church uh, and designate our heavenly position in Christ. And our rule of life really does come from the epistles and this is how we live. We've been crucified with Christ. We're not dipping low into the Sermon on the Mount to try to figure out what's pleasing to God. Christ is the righteousness that exceeds the law uh, and the Pharisees. And now he is our righteousness. And it's upon him who works not, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. And now God is righteous. It's not our righteousness. It's God who is just. In justifying us and giving us life, which is Christ himself. And the righteousness of the law being fulfilled in me is that God is righteous in being able to dispense life into me and even give me the sense of blessing and sonship and fellowship and joy, even though I'm a sinner. And I don't need to do anything about my sin in order to have that joy. All I have to do is believe the gospel and mind the things of the Spirit. And as I do, and I come forward boldly through the blood, by faith, I'm washed. So I get the benefit as if I had repented of sin. And as if I had turned from sin or whatever you tell me to do under law. Because I get Christ who washes me and fills me with joy and peace. And it's a free gift. It's never by me working or striving. It's always by me just believing. We get that from the epistles. You can't get that from the Synoptic Gospels or the Law of Moses. Um, is it all the speaking of Christ? Yes, but his revelation is progressive. And there's a dispensation of the grace of God revealed through Paul called the mystery of Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And that's what dispensationalism is. So I would recommend not listening to anyone who allegorizes the Bible and then tries to tell you what dispensationalism is and why they're not a dispensationalism, dispensationalist. They cannot, if they allegorize the Bible, then they can't teach you from the Bible why they're not a dispensationalist, nor can they define dispensationalism. And that's the problem. It's a straw man argument used to discredit people who don't agree with them while castigating us for not walking in love and being dogmatic. While pretending to walk in unity and love, and yet they host wolves and, and, and command people to walk in love with wolves. That's the doctrine of Balaam. So even though they seem to contend for the gospel of grace and eternal security, at this point they're on my mark and avoid list. And no, I'm not going to mention names in this point. Um... Paul, when he talked to Timothy, mentioned names. 
when he talked to the church at large, he said, just watch the people do this. I don't have to. See, a lot of these people will get offended anyway. And they'll come out and identify themselves. I'll say, here's what Jezebel does. And somebody will come up with their channel and do a message and say, he called me a Jezebel. <laughs> well, if the shoe fits, you know, if that's the way you're going to act and you, you think I'm describing you because that's how you operate, then you just identified yourself. I didn't have to identify you. All I did was tell my subs, here's how Jezebel operates. And then you said, he attacked me. Okay, well, that's what's going on. If, if people are smart, they'll be quiet. And not only that, but they'll repent. See, this is another reason we don't want to say names, if possible, because it gives people a chance to repent. They say, you know what? I'm going to rethink my position. What I'm doing is wrong. I'm, I'm castigating everybody for being dogmatic, but I'm being dogmatic. I'm saying they need to walk in love about secondary issues, but I'm drawing a hard line about dispensationalism. I'm slandering Darby and mischaracterizing dispensationalism to thousands of people, which is opening the door for attacks against present teaching and ministry uh, that are going on. It, it's opening the door and giving people fuel, wolves and witches, fuel to attack people who are genuinely contending for grace. And if you have a conscience and you are supposedly genuinely contending for grace, the Lord's going to deal with you. And, and some of these people are genuine sheep who the Lord has used in the past and just need a wake-up call. And so sometimes they need to be marked and avoided so that they can deal with the Lord. You know, I can't tell you what to do. You do what you do. But I can describe what I'm going to do and I'm going to tell my subs, this, don't listen to this kind of stuff. <laughs> All right, take care.